Hello, Mac. I'm Heather Steckline, the director of the UW Stout Archives and Area Research Center. Welcome to our tour um, of our archives. And we've titled it Peaceful Coexistence, Zoned User Spaces in a University Archives Reading Room, because we're using our tour as a case study on how you can use a relocation to resolve problems that you're having with user space and how it is laid out. So I'll start by talking about our university. We are a polytechnic university that is part of the UW system of public universities. We're one hour east of the Twin Cities. The students in our programs are engaged in specialized programs like apparel design, plastics engineering, gaming design, or hos and hospitality and tourism. We are a polytechnic university. Our students receive four-year bachelor's degrees or um, in some cases master's or doctoral degrees, but the real thrust of our program is that it's a combination of liberal arts and applied learning. So it's everything that you would expect with critical thinking, problem solving, they're still taking required math classes and speech classes and literature classes, but they are all in in their majors. So there's a lot of applied career specific learning that's happening within classes at Stout, which affects us as an archives and our mission, which I'll show you. We have two major collections. We have the university archives, everything that you would expect to see in a university archives documenting what's happened at our institution and its five predecessors since 1891. So we have the yearbooks, we have speeches, we have meeting minutes, we have films, we have all of that kind of stuff, both digital and physical. We also are an area research center, so we are a constituent part of the Wisconsin Historical Society. So we have the official county records for three counties in Wisconsin. And so if people need to see naturalization records or criminal court cases, they would come to see us. Um, so we have all the official records predating 1908. Um, and then we have some affiliated collections that the Wisconsin Historical Society has deemed um, great for posterity that researchers can also look at. So area organizations, um, businesses, families, we have some collections related to them as well. So we have three major user groups. Uh, we have external researchers. So we have people who are coming in to do historical research. We have people who are doing genealogy and we have technicians. So we have people coming in to say, I do you have any aerial photos of where the lake used to be because we want to do some digging here. We want to know what we might hit. I use Caroline Fraser as an example of one of our typical researchers. She uh, did some research with us and it, it, it in part contributed to her Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Lorenz Wilder. We have administrative researchers. A lot of times this is a piece that's overlooked in university archives but also very important. These are faculty and staff planning events, doing group research to assist with accreditations for their unit, um, it, or investigating trends and policies. Things like you know, we used to have a conference every year, but we don't know why we don't do that anymore. Can we see the meeting minutes from when it ended and figure out why? Um, I use the 50th anniversary of the math and computer science major as an example of this kind of research. There were, there was a group that was planning that event and they came in multiple times and planned together and looked at documents together. And uh, they needed that space to collaborate and look at resources. Finally, we have our student and faculty researchers. You know, p faculty members, students coming in to do academic research or personal research uh, using our collections. And sometimes that's a group. Um, in this case, this student, it was part of a group who was examining artifacts from our collection that they then animated in a video game depicting what one of the buildings on our campus looked like in the 19 teens. These researchers, sometimes need the ability to discuss things, to plan things. Uh, and so really what you're seeing is that I have all these researchers with different needs and previously we were all in, they were all in the same space. And we've resolved that when we really re relocated. So we have our introspective researchers. I call them the 
Banker's Lab set. Whenever you see someone in a movie and they're doing introspective research, there's that montage where they're sitting next to the banker's lamp in the big reading room by themselves, you know, with lots of other people quietly researching in tandem. And so these researchers really do want to plug in for hours. They want to look at lots of different kinds of resources and they want to have a quiet ability to think and process. Simultaneously, we have a need for collaborative research. We need pe the whiteboard set. We need people who can show each other things, who can ask each other questions, who can laugh and team build as they progress through a project. And when we have all of those researchers in the same room, they're working at odds with each other. So this is our current space that I'm going to be showing you as our tour. Um, but I'm going to start by showing you our previous space and the kinds of problems that we had with uh, the needs of different users and our staff. So this is where we began on the third floor of the library in a much smaller space that was layered onto too many multiple purposes. So you can see on the bottom left of the map, that rectangle there, the Area Research Center, that was it. We were this little corner of the third floor. We had two small offices with doors. One was my office and the other one we used as a student workspace. And then we had this medium-sized multi-purpose space in the front. There were two staff desks that were right next to where people researched. We had two public microfilm research workstations. And then we had four plain research tables that seated 20 to 25 people. Then you can see just beyond that sign that says 321, you can see our stacks po poking out. There was this wall that only took up about two thirds of the room. And so to either side of this wall, there was a big space, like a six foot space that researchers would just sometimes walk back into our collections thinking that they had the ability to do that, despite signage. So this led to problematic instruction. So this is me conducting an instruction session with a class. Our instruction sessions were realistically capped at 25. And a lot of the classes at Stout actually have 40 students, or, or at least in the 30s. So we had to say no to a lot of, of classes. Plus it got super cramped and super hot, even with 25 people in there. There was no way to manage student belongings. We had a, a couple of small lockers up at the front, but with you know, 25 students, we just didn't have space to put all their belongings, so people are tripping over each other's backpacks. It's hard to um, manage any sort of food and drink, so we really couldn't bring out collections for students to work with in this scenario. The other thing is the archives needed to close to any other researchers during instruction sessions. So you have your historian who wants to come in on Thursday, but you've already scheduled an instruction session. You have to say to that person, yeah, you can come in, but we really need uh, an hour for these students to come in. So you'll have to find something else to do for an hour uh, while we do that. Not ideal. It also led to problematic research. So we had, if you imagine um, being a historian or a technician trying to focus on something very specific at this workstation and then you look up and you see these student groups planning and discussing projects, chit-chatting, um, say, you know, yelling out their discoveries to each other. Very, very not, not a good scenario. And from the student's perspective, you see this person who's looking up every once in a while because you're distracting them and you're feeling guilty about it. It's just not a good uh, fit. Uh, our research tables didn't access digital collections. So many of our collections were, are born digital now. Um, everything, you know, so many departments post 2010, um, their newsletters in print stop and then all of a sudden everything's digitally available. There's a really hard jump, you know, did you bring your laptop? We only had two public workstations that often people were using for microfilm. And so we, we didn't have the ability to make that junk, jump through the hybrid collections. Our staff spaces and collections were unmediated from researchers. Um, we would go to grab something from the back and find someone just kind of pawing through a collection that we had open on our desks. Um, our researchers kept their belongings with them because we didn't have a good space to put them and our room contents were distracting. Uh, we had inherited these um, old card catalog drawers and people would just kind of <laughs> dig through those for fun and, and it's like what are you here to research and they're like oh cool cards they were just obituary cards so we, we needed to minimize some of those distractions 
So our second problem was this collection space, space issue. You know, you saw that we had these collection, this collection space that was unmediated, but that was only about a third of our collection. Our collections were in three different locations in the library. One was in the basement, one was in another part of our third floor, and then we had the immediate um, records. This led to security issues. Even though we have our collections on a secure lock, there were still engineering staff within the campus who were accessing our rooms without us knowing it and sometimes leaving lights on or leaving a door propped open and we would discover this so not great uh, we had inadequate shelving uh, we also had problems monitoring conditions how do you mitigate pest control if you're not in that room all the time or or leaks um, we also had a processing backlog i came across things i didn't know about when we relocated because they'd been out of sight out of mind and then we had retrieval crises we had researchers if i had two researchers in at the same time and I was the only staff member there, someone needed me to retrieve something from one of these remote storage, I just had to say no. So we kind of had this like back of our minds wish list of what we wanted. We wanted to better protect our collections. We wanted an intuitive flow for visitors. We wanted to eliminate distractions like that card catalog. We needed to separate our staff functions from the researchers and we needed to zone our user needs. So we made our big move in 2016, 2017. You can see um, this is the fifth floor map and just kind of us write, writing back and forth with our campus planner on what we needed and where it would go. This happened for three separate reasons. And as I said, serendipity happens, you just need to kind of be ready for it. So where we moved um, is the whole half of fifth floor on the north side. So where it says main collection A to D and the library processing offices, that's what we took over. And this happened for three reasons. One is there was a library budget cut. Um, there was a statewide budget cut for our university system, and two of our technical staff, two and a half of our technical staff members took early retirement, and our university didn't replace them. So we had this large non-public space with only two employees remaining in it. So those two employees were relocated, and that became our public space. So what you're seeing as the library processing offices, that's what we now have as our public space. Then there was a major collection weeding. The library hadn't done a major weed in 15 years, and they were able to reduce their collection stack, stacks on fifth floor by half. So they got basically were able to clear out that main collection A to D, and that became our secure collection. We consolidated all of our collections to that where it says main collection. And then that was just kind of lingering for a little bit, and we had a sudden need um, to relocate it because there was a controversy about a WPA mural on our campus. Our administration decided that since we had the records documenting the creation of that mural and its artist, that relocating the mural to our space would be ideal. And so that fast-tracked the project and gave us a little bit more funding for things like carpet and relocation. So just you know, to summarize, this is the before and after. So before the library processing offices, and now you are seeing how we ended up dividing it with two small office spaces and um, a wall that separated 504, the secure stacks, from the rest of the library. So to aid you in understanding what you're seeing, I have kept the banker's lamp for that introspective space and the whiteboard for the public um, group planning space. So this is what you see when you enter our archives. You see that big WPA mural on your right, and you see that if you turn left at the clock, you get to the introspective space. If you turn left beyond that partition, then you end up in the collaborative research space. If you turn around, you can see that, and you know, the yellow is your viewpoint, the star is you, um, and you can see that there are 40 small lockers now so that when researchers come in, they can lock them up. And then we have our registration uh, station where visiting researchers can fill out our research form and students can scan in with their IDs when they come in for class. This is the introspective research space. So the two microfilm reading stations are there. All of our public newspaper um, on microfilms are next to those stations. We have a small table so that the researchers can look at ledger books, look at maps. Uh, and this is really kind of the quiet mediated space. There's also a nice city view looking out the window. Um, 
this is what it looks like when you're looking at the collaborative research and instruction space. So um, this is the whiteboard set um, and everything that you see in yellow on the left is what you're looking at. At the front, there is a presentation station and a podium, which actually consists of one of our former president's desks. Uh, we have a pair of clock hands from our clock tower, which is kind of cool. And then there are six collaboration pods. Each collaboration pod has a 42-inch monitor at the end of it. We got a student tech fee grant to purchase those. And we can seat up to 42 students at a time. And we can also use this for public events. We can bring in extra chairs and probably seat up to about 60 people in this space. This also um, allowed us to consolidate our collections in a very thoughtful way that was much better than having it in three separate locations. This is secured to a key that very, very few people can get to. We can walk through it on a daily basis, and we were able to organize our collections in a much more thoughtful way. We were also able to do a lot of mitigation of preservation issues. Our ledger books were previously kind of crammed onto shelves standing up and we were able to lay them flat now and they're much safer than they were previously. So this is how our, our space has kind of changed the way that we use things. So on the right, you see the public events. We are able to have book talks. We're able to have reminiscence lectures that we record from you know, people who retired years ago and have memories of our campus. On the left, we're able to have active instruction sessions. So you know, previously, it was very lecture-based. I'm going to show you lots of slides. Now it's we flip the classroom, and we have the students do a lot of group work with objects. So one th cool thing about this one, is you can see that they have a slide up on their monitor that says wood blocks and silk screen. The students created that. They had previously come and examined these objects and then they did research. Each table had a, a type of object. So this was kind of a printing table. There was an audio recording table. There was a photograph table. And each group created a slide to interpret the objects and then they came back for their second session and then the advanced these advanced communication students were able to navigate each table and see what their colleagues had found. So our new opportunity is to use our space to create and maintain partnerships in this very active learning way on the um, on these collaborative stations. We're able to get our students at that creating and evaluating part of Bloom's taxonomy while we're still maintaining the integrity of our research room and allowing people to do the introspective research that they need to do when they are wanting to create major projects for their work. So I'll end by just saying that a lot of this happened because we were kind of prepared for it. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. We kind of knew what we wanted and we were able to articulate it when the opportunity happened. So observe what you need, plan for how you might resolve it, and just dream about a time when um, opportunities like this might come your way. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have any questions, please email me at the address at the bottom. And if you're ever in the area, just stop in. We'd love to show you it in person. Thank you.